Welcome, everyone, for another interview at Room for Discussion. And today is a very special one, as for the first time, we'll have a guest that is not present in the e-hall currently, but is on, on our screen virtually, and he's physically in Great Britain. It is Sir Paul Collier, even though he doesn't want to be referred as such, but he has written numerous books on fascinating topics from development, aid, economics, and now more than not, communitarianism. So as you probably can tell, um, Paul knows a lot about a lot, and we're going to take advantage of that today. So bear with us when we discuss modern inequalities, lack of community, and look at global governance. Uh, but you don't want to hear us chatting, so without further ado, let's give a warm applause to the man behind your lecture readings, Sir Paul Collier. Can you see us? We can indeed, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Hi, and hi, Tim. Hi. Yeah, hi. I forgot to introduce our names, but this is Alan. I'm Tim. Yeah, hello. Um, <laughs> Lovely to have you here today. Um, do you have a busy day ahead of you? Or? I sure do, yeah. I have a busy day behind me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so just right in the middle, it's like lunch break this. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like that. It's okay. really light. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, absolutely lovely you're here today, uh, virtually. Um, we, in preparation of this interview, we have read a lot of your books, quite a few of them. And we saw a bit of a break between them with topic-wise, as your previous book was mostly on development, aid, migration, the more uh, development economic style interview, uh, books, while your last two were more about domestic issues, communitarianism, uh, disparities within Great Britain. Why this shift? Did you become more homesick? Um, possibly. That's a, good, uh, that's a good start with an explanation. Um, uh, I grew up in circumstances very, very different from what I find myself in now. Um, I'm now living in the, you know, the, 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 the part of the, the postcode with the highest ratio between house prices uh, and, and income anywhere in Britain, right? Um, and I'm at this very fancy University of Oxford, and, uh, I, you know, I've sort of done, done pretty well. Um, um, but I didn't start like that. I, I was born in what is now the poorest um, region of England, South Yorkshire. Um, and my parents were a, a shop assistant who married a pork butcher. Both of them had left school when they were 12 and so had no education whatsoever. Um, and all my relatives had stayed in South Yorkshire and I go and visit them regularly. I was there yesterday. Um, and the gulf between their opportunities and my life is just so disgracefully huge um, that it's basically steered my soul. Um, uh, 12, 13 years ago, I adopted two little kids who were my relatives, um, and I adopted them because um, they'd had such a shitty start in life um, um, that it, some, you know, I, was I, this I, the, the spark that changed the focus as like this chasm yeah, has been was, present yeah, for a while but that's the spark where you said all right I need to focus my academic prowess on domestic um, yeah, and, and in starting to do that I realized that there's an astonishing similarity between the problems of trying to get a very poor country to lift out of a poverty trap and trying to get a very poor region and very poor people in a poor region to lift out of a poverty, poverty trap. I work a lot with Tim Besley, um, who's uh, even fancier than I am. He's <laughs> professor uh, um, at a much younger age than I am. Um, but um, but that, in working together, uh, he said it's just astonishing how analytically it's the same damn structure. Um, whether it's a very poor region uh, in a rich country or a very poor country uh, in a poor continent. Um, and so um, it's not as analy analytically different um, uh, as might, might appear. In fact, by working on very poor countries and seeing their problems very starkly, um, that's a very good way of breaking into understanding what's going on in regions that have become very poor in rich countries. So 
Um, um, on, on that, that note, note uh, a, a red, red thread, thread in your last two books, books uh, is communitarianism, right? Identify lack of community as one of the causes of this disparity. Uh, could you just define communitarianism for us today? Yeah, yeah so, so I just have to backtrack a little bit. Um, um, uh, human, evolutionary biology is a, is a major new research area. Um, and so the sort of the gods in my universe are Joe Heinrich, who's head of the Department of Evolutionary Biology at Harvard, um, Nicholas Christakis, who's head of the same thing at Yale. Um, and I know both of them and interact with both of them. Um, and what they've shown is that, uh, and they're not the only people who've shown it, but what they've shown is that humans are a very unusual mammal. We are a mammal, right? And um, other mammals uh, are really, there's pretty well only one way of being a mammal other than us, um, and that's to be uh, greedy and selfish um, and, and lazy if you can get away with it. Um, um, and that's a, you know, that's a pretty un unattractive characteristic. Um, uh, if you've got a cat in your household, um, then uh, look at a cat and you've seen a greedy, selfish and lazy mammal, right? Um, the, um, uh, but although we're mammals, and so we're capable of being reduced to greedy, selfish, lazy um, we're very very unusual mammals we're very pro-social so we care about others we're very creative and so we can imagine conditions that are better than our present situation and um, and not not any imaginative but creative in trying to find solutions how to um, improve our situation but the pro-sociality means that we are hardwired, we've evolved through evolution uh, to uh, want the uh, respect of others in our community. And so to be prepared within reason to sacrifice our own interests for the interests of others in the community. And that's a very, very valuable instinct. It means that we're willing to not to be me now, <laughs> selfish, and think about others, we, um, uh, and and in the future. So, um, um, could you give us, us just, just to like, like bring it down, down the ground? Could you give us an, an example of a communitarian society, society today in the world? Well, well, I'll give you an example of one that's suddenly become that, um, and it's quite dramatic, um, and it's what um, President Zelensky has managed to do in in Ukraine. Okay. So. You know, until, until Russia invaded, and Ukraine was a very bitterly divided society, um, mired in corruption, two different languages, um, uh, and um, very little sense of coming together around a common purpose. Um, and so it was, a, you know, it was a society just full of problems. Um, and then um, Putin invades, and Zelensky is a becomes a brilliant communicator. Of course, he is a communicator. What's his core job? He's a comedian. He knows how to communicate, right? And so he uses that skill of communication to become what I call a, communi a, a communicator in chief. Mm. And so he says, "Look." Um, first of all, he establishes his credibility. He says, I'm going to stay in Kiev. And that's basically a statement at the time of, I'm prepared to die for this country. Mm. Right? Um, that's a pretty dramatic demonstration that he cares about the place. Right? That, he care that he's willing to make a sacrifice himself for the people of Ukraine. Which and is that gives him the moral authority to say, and now <clears throat> I want you all to resist, to resist Putin. Yeah? So would you say you need a national goal, at least a, a goal represented by a nation to inspire this community feeling? 
Yes, exactly. He's, he, by, by making, by demonstrating his own moral commitment, okay. he's able to say to others, you too must rise above your own selfish interests, your own individual selfish interests, run away. Eh? Yeah. If you're a man of, um, of within uh, a, an age range, um, your, your duty is to stay and fight. Now, and then he says, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to fight. I don't know how we're going to resist, but I'm going to try and get you the, the materiel um, from other countries. We're going to shame other countries to do that. Um, and then you, you'll get the equipment and then you sort out how to use it, how best to resist. So he devolves agency to teams locally and says, you join your militia, you fight. Now that's a communitarian strategy and guess what? It works. Um, very rapidly, the Russian-speaking Ukrainians and the Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians come together and decide, never mind whether we're Russian-speaking or not, we're all Ukrainian. There's a we, which suddenly we aspire to, right? And we've got to step up and actually, um, actually join our militias and try and fight. It's, it's fascinating uh, to see this unity uh, in, in, in Ukraine. Ukraine. This is very, very much a crisis, crisis situation. situation. But like, like, I'd like take to step, step back, back to your, your books. books. Uh, you, you focus, focus on, on British society. society. Um, as, as I can, can see across, across the channel, channel, there's, there's not, not a lot, lot of, of unity, unity there. there. But, but how, how would, would you define, define then the British community, community the British society? society? Um, it's deeply polarized, right? Mm. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's uh, the Ukraine before Zelensky, as it were. Um, and um, a good indicator of, um, of inequality is, um, is the mobility between generations. There's a fancy name for it, but it's basically intergenerational social mobility. If you're born in the poorest two or three deciles of the income distribution. So if you're born in the bottom 30 or 40%, what's your chances of moving to the top 30 or 40%? Right? Um, and at the moment in Britain, we've got the lowest intergenerational social mobility in the whole of the OECD. Right? That is to say, in all the advanced countries in the world. That is a total disgrace, right? Um, we're massively unequal intergenerationally. We're also pretty unequal just within uh, uh, a generation. But it's that in inequality between mobility of generations that's, that's the real killer. Because it means if you're, and, it, and there are two things that decide it. Where are you born? And did your parents go? Have, have, did either of your parents have any university education? So huh? you were born in Sheffield, right? Um, yeah. And you identify in your one of your latest books, The Future of Capitalism, uh, one of the reasons for this divide in Britain that you mentioned is uh, regional inequalities. So you have the superstar cities. Uh, in your case, it would be London. And then you have left behind places like Sheffield, like mining towns, etc. So... Um, why would you say that uh, community plays such a big role in this specific divide, the regional divide? Yeah, so we didn't used to have anything like as bad as that. When I grew up in Sheffield, which was quite a long time ago, but you know, still in the, in, the, in the 20th century rather than the 19th, um, 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 when I grew up in Sheffield, it was a prosperous town. It was, it was a, a city that specialised in... in, in in steel and coal, mm. and uh, we got the, the finest specialist steel in the world. Um, we'd invented the Bessemer process, um, and um, uh, we were the world leader in cutlery. Uh, so um, I, my uh, great-grandparents, my great-grandmother was a very rare um, uh, woman leading a little cutlery firm huh? Huh? In, in Sheffield. Huh? Um, uh, so she was, she was what's called a little, little, little master cutler. Right? Impressive. Um, and, um, uh, and that goes right back to um, um, 
to Chaucer in the 13th century. Which is, you know, there's a line in Chaucer, the, the, the Sheffield knife. And so it was a 700 year old tradition that got completely destroyed in the 1980s, by which time I'd left. Right? Uh, and both the steel industry collapsed and the coal industry collapsed. And so in my day, there was a lot of pride in skill and it was a prosperous city. And now both its core industries are smashed. They were smashed 40 years ago, but nothing's replaced them. So the regional the identity, identity got, got hurt. hurt. I'm sorry? sorry? The regional identity got hurt? Absolutely, because the pride was smashed. People have had 40 years of failure. And so, guess what? They start to blame each other. Mm. Right? They've got nostalgia for the past, which is, you know, kind of, that's going to lead nowhere. You can't go back to the past. Um, um, but, um, and they ask, why did we fail? And either you blame um, each other, you know, the, 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 uh, the workers blame business and the business blames the council and the, you know, everybody blames each other or everybody blames immigrants or whatever, you know, um, or um, you blame some big baddie outsider, um, you know, you blame, you blame Whitehall for everything. And either way, you don't take responsibility for changing things. And so the really hard step is to say, we are the only ones who can get ourselves out of this. We've got to have a forward looking strategy and we've got to learn as we go um, how, to, how to get out of this mess. Um, and that's feasible, but hard. Um, and South York is starting to do that. that. It's, it's very exciting, exciting to see it happening. It happening. Um, uh, um, but, but it is a, a really, tough thing to do and it's exactly the same as what has to happen in a in a very poor country um you, only only they can get themselves out of this situation and for that they've got to look forward and try and come together around some common purpose uh, in which everybody is going to have to make some sacrifices for that new common purpose so um, you, you are, are actually, actually one, one of the people, people that, that are taking, taking action, action to do this, this right? You're a policy advisor for leveling up in Britain. So it's, it's a, a Tory initiative to uh, reduce social and economic imbalances for the people in the audience. audience. Um, and what's, what's the one thing you would like, like to achieve uh, within your work, work for leveling up? up? Um, I'd like to persuade uh, the Whitehall, the government, that it cannot level up Sheffield. Mm. Um, which is a message that they don't want to hear. Um, Britain's the most centralized country, as well as the lowest social mobility country, and uh, there's a good, <laughs> the two are connected. Um, uh, in Britain, all the decisions, both government decisions and finance sector decisions, um, uh, happen in London. Um, but London doesn't know enough about the context of South Yorkshire um, to be able to come up with a viable strategy. Um, so the basic principles of- Isn't that the biggest thing of the district, district system, system of, of your political, political system, system that, that there are representatives of, of the country, country in London, London to, to co combat, combat this problem? problem. But, but it's, it's just, just not enough. enough. Um, you know, who's, who's, who is recruited into Whitehall or into the city of London or into the finance sector, um, um, people whose um, parents have both had education and who live in the southeast, because that's what determines your life chances at the moment. If your parents, if neither of your parents went had any education, and if you grow up outside the southeast, your chances of making it are very, very low. Um, and if you do succeed, the temptation is to think, oh, I've succeeded because I'm brilliant, I'm totally exceptional, and so I deserve it. And if I deserve it because of my efforts, all these people who have not, not, not succeeded, well, they should have done, and it's their fault. So there's a, there's a double danger that the people who are most of the people recruited into 
either the City of London, the financial sector, or Whitehall, don't come from backgrounds that have any lived experience of, of being really poor and having no opportunities. And even quite a few of the very few people who make it misinterpret their own success as I've done it, I deserve it. And, and it, it took me a long time to work out that, no, I've just been very, very lucky. Um, and when I grew up, the chances were higher than they are now. Um, so nowadays, the chance of somebody from my background in Sheffield uh, making it to the top are very, very low. Um, when I grew up, the chances were higher. They were still low, but they, but they, were, they were greater than zero, right? Yeah. Which is a trend that should definitely, definitely be reversed. reversed. Um, speaking on like London, London you, everything, everything is centralized, centralized compared to London. London. Would, Would you, you say, say that everything besides, besides London is a left mind place, place in Britain? No, no there's, there's, a, there's a penumbra. There's a sort of, um, there's, a, there's a concept of the magic triangle, which is London, Cambridge, Oxford, um, and it basically extends to the southeast. Why Cambridge and Oxford? Because all the people who are now successful in London um, basically went either to Oxford or to Cambridge. And so they love coming back. It's, it's only an hour on the train. They can come back, have lunch, um, meet their old tutors and say, haven't I done well? Aren't I amazing? Um, and, uh, and so Oxford and Cambridge have no difficulty raising finance. Um, uh, people are just um, uh, pouring over us, trying to give us money. Um, uh, but, um, but if you're in Sheffield, people aren't pouring over you, trying to give you money. Okay, but like, uh, th these are the two extremes, of course. You have like uh, London, like in an in equality, equality debate, debate it's automatically, automatically go, go to the extremes of things. things. Uh, but, uh, but I'm, I'm interested, interested about what my piece is about, about some, uh, trying, trying to get, get your uh, opinions on it. it. Uh, is that, that in this inequality, inequality there's, there's a lot of middle ground, ground middle cities, like Birmingham, like Manchester, uh, like Manchester but, also but also not cities, cities also like towns in the middle that aren't, per se, in disarray, but, but are, are just rich suburbs. suburbs. Where do they fit in this? Are these lesser versions of extremes? Or just a category above the divide? Okay, so let's take Birmingham. Really important. Birmingham is Britain's sexy city. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's never, never had the prestige of Britain's second city, um, uh, but it, but um, but it's now, thank God, thanks to thanks to COVID, um, uh, um, and the combination of COVID and Brexit, and um, the appalling scandal of um, Russian oligarchs and their yachts and London lawyers. Uh, saving the skin of Russian oligarchs, um, which is what they've been doing, um, uh, London no longer looks very attractive. And so a lot of people who are not from London, but have had to go there to get a job, um, are now realized, I don't need to live in London all the time. I can live back where I come from and maybe keep a little flat in London or maybe just do it by Zoom, come in on a train. Um, and Birmingham, um, you know, the, the government is building a very fast train to Birmingham. And so um, the narrative uh, that's developing is that Birmingham is the new London. And that's very, very hopeful. Um, for example, one of the big four banks, HSBC, has just shifted its headquarters from London to Birmingham. Wow. That's fantastic, right? Now, um, Birmingham is, uh, is, is developing a financial center um, uh, and, um, and it's starting to lift, to lift up. It's, you know, so um, why does that matter? Because um, Sheffield and South Yorkshire can learn a lot from Birmingham and the West Midlands. I, 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 I like the concept of scaffolding. If you, if, you, if you want to build a tall building, what you need is scaffolding. Um, but once the tall building's built, you take the scaffolding down. 
So if you want to build a tall building, you learn nothing by looking at a tall building that's already finished. Right? You can just say, oh, it's tall. Right? It doesn't tell you how to build it. You need to see something that's sufficiently recent that the scaffolding's still there. And so Sheffield can learn a lot from Birmingham. It can't learn anything from Cambridge or Oxford. You come to Oxford, God, we're prosperous. Right? Yeah, people are throwing money at us. Um, that's just demoralizing for a place like Sheffield. But learning from Birmingham, the scaffolding's still there. And so that's why these middle, middle cities, as you said, Leeds is like that, Manchester's like that. And they're the places which are the models for, from which um, the really poor places can learn. So, um one, One of the, the then solutions, solutions to try to create, create a more, more multicolor England, England, right? Uh, uh, can, can you do, do this without, without dimming the shine of London, London so to speak? Oh, oh that's the truth. The, 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 the pushback, pushback from, from uh, Lon London, for that matter, you know, Oxbridge, to say, well, of course we want levelling up, but don't touch our privilege. <laughs> um, you know, come off it, you know? Um, is Oxford going to collapse because um, Sheffield University um, uh, uh, gets the attention it deserves? No, right? Um, uh, Oxford's got so much bloody magic um, that um, uh, we don't need to have our egos protected, right? And nor does London. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, the survey evidence that, um, because the government's very worried about all this levelling up, um, what do people think um, about it? And it turns out that um, there's overwhelming agreement all around the country that it's unfair for opportunities to depend on where you're born. Um, in fact, it's even more amazing than that. Um, it's the only thing in Britain, because Britain's so polarized at the moment, it's the only issue on which there is a consensus that cuts across political parties, um, cuts across whether you voted Brexit or not, cuts across religions, cuts across ethnicity and all of it. No matter how you slice it, there's overwhelming an agreement on this, right? Um, there's also um, pretty universal agreement that Whitehall won't be able to do it. Um, and I think that's right, right? Both of those are right. Here's a unifying moral purpose. We've got to get rid of this vast inequality and in opportunity, depending on where you're born. Um, and uh, it's not something that Whitehall can do to Sheffield. Sheffield has to have the agency to do it itself. And that's about devolution of powers and some money. Perfect. I think this, this is, is a brilliant, brilliant opportunity, opportunity to open, open the floor, floor to the, the audience. audience. So if anyone, anyone in the audience has a question, question please raise your hand. hand. We have um, a lady here in the second row with a grey shirt. One second. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I was, was wondering, wondering, we talked about the communitarism that is rising now in Ukraine thanks to the war. But I was wondering if, if there is anything, anything that, that could, could be, be as effective, effective as the, the, the crisis, crisis in, in order, order to raise the communitarianism or, or the enhanced sense, sense of community, which I agree that is very important these days, especially with climate change and the efforts we need to do. So I was thinking if there is something as effective or could be potentially as crisis to ra raise the sense of community in, in our world. Yes. Yeah, Thank that's you. a really good question. Um, I mean, in the Ukraine, it was enormously helped, of course, by Putin um, bombing um, uh, Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine. Um, uh, nobody ever looks up from the skies and said, says, ah, good, we're bombing us, right? Um, bombing is something that a they does to you. Um, and so Putin, that, by bombing uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians, uh, he persuaded Russian-speaking Ukrainians pretty rapidly 
I'm, <laughs> I'm a Ukrainian, never mind, or, you know. Um, so um, let's think um, the issue of climate change, right? Now, um, I don't know if you followed the latest election in Australia, it just happened over the weekend. And it, it's, in my mind, very good news um, because Australia is a very rich country, one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, and it was a country in which the government refused to make any sacrifices uh, in the interests of uh, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, and, um, and that was deeply unethical because if you, if you ask, um, who should move first on reducing carbon emissions? Should it be the poorest countries or should it be the richest? Yeah? Another way of phrasing it is to say there are, there are, there's a lot of income generated by extraction of oil. Who should be selling the last barrel of oil in the world? Should it be the richest countries in the world, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, or should it be the poorest countries in the world? As soon as you pose that question, what's the sequence in which we should reduce carbon emissions? It's bloody obvious. The richest countries, Australia, Germany, America, Sweden, well, Swedish, aren't you? <laughs> Sweden lost us to posture as this moral superpower. Sure did. Um, you know, you're still digging coal, um, as I understand it. Um, so, you know, is that so super moral? Germany's just opened a bloody coal, coal mine, pipe, you know, a coal mine, and has decided to, um, to, to rely on uh, brown lignite coal, the dirtiest, least efficient form of power. Um, uh, and the, the, these things are disgraceful. Um, America, obviously, you know, quite disgraceful in failure to step up to, and Australia. And the great news in Australia is that people recognize that. And so, um, well, you know, Australians are not saints. We're not, we're not hardwired to be saints, but we are hardwired to be morally purposive within reason, right? You know? Um, we're not going to make huge sacrifices for others, but we're willing to make, we actually, um, morally purposive actions um, make us feel good about ourselves um, in contributing to something bigger than ourselves. And that's what Australians voted for. And, um, you know, in all honesty, the, the guy who's taken over as uh, Prime Minister of Australia uh, doesn't look impressive. Um, but he's a damn sight better than the the the, the guy who um, Scott Morrison. Yeah, who was prime minister. So, so um, people in the Australians can feel good about themselves. They actually voted to be morally purposes to make some modest sacrifices in the interest of climate change, and that's what's got to happen in Sweden. That's what's, I think, got to happen in Germany. I just was in Munich giving a lecture. Um, about three or four weeks ago on exactly that. And to my uh, delight, the, the audience came round to that view that, yeah, we, we've, we've actually got to stop kidding ourselves that our self-interest is all we need. Um, no, we've got to actually um, make some sacrifices for a larger purpose. I know we have a lot of Germans in the audience, so, so I think it's, it's a good, good point. point. <laughs> yeah, well, well, over the new Germans. Germans you know. yeah. <laughs> um, do we have any other, other questions? Question? Yes. yes. Uh, so, so the, the lady, lady in the red, red shirt. shirt. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, previously, we mentioned that you draw a parallel between there's something we can learn from like currently economically poor countries and the UK, uh, and they make the comparison. Well, maybe Sheffield can learn from Birmingham, but what can Sheffield learn from like currently economically poor countries on poor continents? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. That's a good question. Um, um, I'll tell you what I learned. 
I, I don't think it's what Sheffield can learn particularly, but it's, it's what I learned. Um, because there's a lot of the countries I work on, worked on for many years, um, are deeply fragmented um, into rival oppositional identities. You know, the, the Kikuyu blame the Luo, the Luo blame the Kikuyu, and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and so, because they're divided, um, people just aren't willing to come together around some forward-looking common, common purpose. People are trapped in backward-looking blame games. And I see that, and I've seen that for, you know, unfortunately, for years, and sometimes it flares up into outright violence um, uh, all too often. Um, but at other times, it just immobilizes the society. It traps the society in a, in a pattern where because people won't come together and devise a common forward-looking strategy around a common purpose, um, the society keeps failing. And because it keeps failing, that appears to confirm the, uh, the, the blame game. We fail, I fail because of what you did, you know? And so um, that's what I learned. And that's what I see in places like Sheffield, South Yorkshire now. And so that's why, as it were, what I, what I can try and help bring to places like South Yorkshire is a recognition, put up, hold a mirror to them and say, you know, do you realize you've got a society that's at the moment fragmented into these, this backward looking blame game. And as long as you do that, you'll not get out of the, the trap. Um, and, um, and indeed, that's what we've been, I've got a team which is sort of working very much very closely with, with South Yorkshire and, um, and they have seen that and they have surmounted it and come together. It's quite remarkable how people have been able to come together once they sort of look at themselves in a mirror and say, no, oh, we can do better than that. That's, uh, I think, a lovely, optimistic place, place to end on. So, so um, we're going to thank you guys for your questions. questions. Uh, uh, on, on this, this note, note of, of like, historical, historical development, development, you talk, talk about, about um, the, the shift, shift for, for, like, like to bipolar, bipolar society, society, for example, in uh, Britain. Britain. So, so um, you, actually you actually place, place the golden years, years of social, social democracy, democracy or communitarianism somewhere between post-war and 1970s. Um, but I'm wondering if this is actually the case for everyone. So, for example, uh, free abortion was, was legalized, legalized in the UK in 1969, 1969 which, is which is quite early compared to a lot of other, other countries. countries. So, so uh, these, these golden, golden years, years, would they, they also have been the golden, golden years, years for me, for example? No, no of course not. not. And, you know, um, America's golden years in the first half of the 20th century were not golden for black people. So, um, um, the, there are always fights in which um, people struggle for inclusion. Um, and those are noble fights, right? But the key difference is, is it a fight for inclusion or is it a fight for privilege? But it um, sounds inclusion, like in creating a community, it's automatically exclusion within the community. Um, the, uh, the, the, the community um, is bounded because you've got to know who's who's in the community and who's not in it, because a community is a network of reciprocal commitments. It's mutual commitments. I'll make sacrifices for this common purpose if you do. That's the reciprocity, and that's the glue that keeps people together. But can we um, create these strong, strong communities, communities from, from the 60s, 60s in today's, today's more diverse, diverse world? world. As, As you, you said, said uh, when we were talking about Sheffield, Sheffield you, you can't, can't go back, back to, to the, the past, past looking for solutions. Is that at the beginning, beginning of the interview? How could like, this is a completely different, different world? world? How, How can, can we recreate, recreate these communities? communities? Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you can, you, know, you can, anybody, no matter what their color, their gender, whatever, can, um, can be part of a we, right? And the battle is is indeed to, to to make that happen. So there's a continuous struggles to try and get 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 new groups included, um, and those are heroic struggles. But they are struggles to say 
I want to be part of the we. Right? Um, and the more we, we have, have those struggles, struggles and, and we, we win, win them, them the, the better. better. Right? Uh, I want to be part of the we. Um, why does all that matter? Because this process of mutual obligations, um, that's what creates rights. You know, the same engine which produces rights uh, is also producing the obligations to enable the rights. Um, and the, the disaster is when claims for rights get completely detached from the process of creating obligations. Um, if it's all my rights and your obligations, who's you? you know? yeah. um, if everybody wants to say, no, I'm a victim, I want rights, um, who's the you? And then the you becomes the state. Um, and the state is then overloaded with demands which you can't meet. Um, and in trying to meet them, you then get the final lunacy, which is the West Coast of America, which is um, my struggle for freedom against the state. Um, uh, let's dismantle the state. So and actually, then it takes you to to, uh, to, to, to the, 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 the lunar um, fiasco. The, you know, the, the philosophy behind crypto is let's get rid of the state. And so I, on this note, the demanding, demanding rights, I almost, almost on the expense, expense of the community. community. Uh, I actually, actually wanted, wanted to read a quote from your book, book Read Is Dead. Dead. We, we have, have it here with us on stage. stage. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you wrote, you wrote this with, with uh, Sir John Kay, and on page 44, you talk about uh, protest movements of today, uh, and you say here that um, the great protest movements of the past, so like the suffragettes, the civil rights movements, were conducted by people venting complaints about injustices directly suffered by them. The new activist causes, causes are, more are more abstract, abstract and, their and their demands framed, framed only in the most, most general of terms. terms. At, At their, their worst, they are, are no more than performative, performative opportunities to display the emoting self. self. And, and I was, I was wondering, you also mentioned it now, isn't this characterization you're making of modern protest movements, demanding rights at the expense of the community, isn't that uh, a generalization? Oh, sure, it is. Yeah, so it's not, you know, you have to look at particular cases, right? So um, is this a struggle um, for uh, inclusion or is it a struggle for privilege? Um, and you know, that, that, that's, a, I think, a, in a way, a, a, a more important distinction than, um, than the one you've read out, which is a distinction between sort of the, am I doing this for, for, as a performance uh, or because uh, it's based on my own experience? Um, so I think, I think that whether, whether what's being demanded is inclusion in the whole um, or um, uh, or privilege relative to the whole. So would you deem like climate change protests, protests to be inclusion within? within. I, don't I don't see, see how, how would that, that work, work in this dichotomy? dichotomy? So it depends, so it depends on, what on what we're protesting, what, what we're demanding, demanding right? right? If we're saying um, our country is rich and therefore um, we should uh, be the first to reduce our carbon emissions, that's, that's, I think, wholly good. That's we, as a whole group, should make the sacrifices for the larger purpose of the, of the world community. Of, of poor, you know? um, uh, if we're saying um, uh, um, what, if, we're, if we're saying what should happen is that um, uh, the World Bank should force poor countries um, not to produce uh, um, oil, that's very bad. Right? It's using the power of the wealthy to force change on the poorest countries, which the rich are not prepared to make themselves. So would you say that solidarity protests, protests are, are in, in general, general more formative compared, compared to, to fighting, fighting for, for uh, uh, inclusion? inclusion? And um, and there are, there are you know there's some painful trade-offs here, um, um, 
uh, in Britain, there's, uh, there was recently um, attempts to um, uh, close uh, motorways, um, which resulted in ambulances not being able to take emergency cases to hospital. And that's a real, that, that's tough, right? You're, 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 you're taking on yourself the power to say, those guys going to hospital are gonna die because of what I believe. Then it's, then, then it's tough. Then it's the question is, is that, you know, is that, under what circumstances is that reasonable? And in some circumstances it would be. Uh, in other cases, when is it not reasonable? Um, but, but so, so you, you also, also you, you talk, talk about, about uh, forcing, forcing uh, poor, poor countries, countries to change, for example, the World Bank. Bank. Um, I, I agree with that distinction that, that uh, I, mean, I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't like, like to see that, that. But, but this thing with forcing, forcing someone, someone to change, change isn't, isn't that, that at many, many times, times the whole point of the protest movement. movement. You, have you have to do uncomfortable things, you have to create difficult situations in order to create a needed change. Yes, absolutely. But you've just got to ask, uh, am I demanding that other people in my society make sacrifices which, um, which are in the benefit of a larger group, in this case everybody in the world, um, and is it morally right that my own society should be doing this? Um, in the case of, as I say, in the case of Australia, um, yeah, you needed these protests to say, for goodness sake, we're a very rich society that's emitting a lot of carbon. And of course, what, what really brought it home to Australians was their own um, uh, climate conditions. They, 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 they realized, oh, oh my God, you know, this is serious. Um, and so reality has a, uh, fortunately, reality has a tendency of um, puncturing um, uh, false, false, false beliefs. Um, though it's sometimes bloody slow about it. Right? I wish it did hurry up in America, right? Uh, and what's, reality is often, uh, lead, bad leaders often try and neutralize reality with their own crazy propositions, which is what uh, Erdogan, is, Erdogan is doing in, in Turkey at the moment, you know, trying to neutralize um, uh, reality by, uh, by false ideas. It's clearly what Putin is trying to do in Russia. To, to bring it back to Australia, um, you, you talked, talked about, about reciprocal obligations, obligations before, and, and uh, Australia, Australia voting, voting this way, way um, partly because, because of climate change concerns. concerns. And, and you, you can almost say it's them realizing the reciprocal obligations they have to the rest of the world. world. So, so if, if you, you do look, look at this international community, um, where, where do you see, see these like, like obligations, the sense of community, community where is it present, present in the international sphere? sphere? So, so where is it present, present in the international sphere? sphere? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think, think um, obviously, obviously it's harder hard to build the international, international level because we, we don't, don't have a world, world government, and I'm very glad we don't have a world government. government. You know, even more crazy to centralize them than, than London, London running, running Britain. Britain. Uh, London's, London's such a bad problem running, running, running Britain. Britain. Just, Just imagine <laughs> a world government would have a world government. So, um, so thank, you, thank you, but no thank you to world government. But building some common purposes, I mean, this is at its best what social media should be, but it, of course it isn't. Right? Uh, at its best, social media would build common purposes um, uh, around the, the many issues where we face existential dangers, um, uh, which are not just uh, climate change. I mean, I, I think the, the scariest is, um, is probably artificial intelligence getting out of control, um, which is a highly technical issue, which you're better equipped to handle than I am, right? Because the young are more tech savvy than the old, but AI is a very dangerous um, thing. And the, the danger is that it'll get picked up by um, security services. Um, and each country, you know, China, America, maybe Europe, will we'll say, oh, it's militarily essential to develop uh, AI, this, this automatic learning process. Um, and 
we don't, we, you know, it, it's disastrous to have automatic learning processes in which at no point uh, a human's able to say no. That's, <laughs> we are hardwired um, as in our brains to make judgments under uncertainty. AI is not. So here, to... like um, a way to, to put in this success community, community in the international sphere would be to share knowledge, knowledge around, around AI, AI to develop, develop it together. together. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the tech savvy young people who understand AI need to develop, develop a network which says, says this stuff's like dangerous. dangerous. Right? If, if we, we give power over to our uh, militaries to use AI, um, it'll end up killing us all. So, um, yeah. You can do that much better than me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think I think this actually brings, brings us nicely, nicely to um, what, what we have seen as red thread in your work, work which is identifying these uh, problems, problems, like, like for example, example uh, non-cooperation non AI, and then, then provide solutions, solutions to them. Um, would, you would you say, say that you're optimistic about our future? future? Do you know, no, I, I, um, I, I learned a long time ago that optimism, pessimism, isn't a good education. I've, I've worked for 50 years on Africa and I've seen the cycles of over-optimism, over, you know, then crashing into, into pessimism. Um, what I try and do um, is, is, uh, is realism. Um, realism in which the, the burning question that I always ask myself is given where we are, what is useful now as the next step? What can I do as a person to help things um, given where we are now? Um, and, um, and I have a, a tourniquet, which is to say, if it's something I don't know anything about, um, I don't want to get involved because I could be bloody dangerous. Right? Um, Generic knowledge with no contextual knowledge is a very dangerous animal. Um, and, uh, and so I try and limit myself to, to I'll, I'll, I think, what next can usefully be done in contexts where I know enough so that I'm not likely to be dangerous. Um, but the basic principle I have, um, which I call fusion, is that the sort of knowledge I have, generic knowledge, is easy to share. I can write little books about it. Um, I can give talks about it. And so it's eminently shareable. Um, the vital thing is that the power of agency, of action, has to lie with the people who have the contextual knowledge, the lived experience of being in this place, in a community, and knowing what's feasible now and what isn't. And so fusing the shareable generic knowledge with the stuff that can't be shared, the lived experience of in this context now, this is possible and this isn't, that's the challenge. And that's what I try and help on. And speaking of that sharing the, the general, general knowledge, knowledge um, what, what topic, topic of economics, economics or what topic in academia uh, should be more focused in book writing? As um, you have had a list of books on a range of topics, where would you feel like there's still a gap to be uh, delved in? Well, I'll tell you what I'm working on. I've nearly finished it. Right? Our next book, my next book, <laughs> um, fuses um, the, the ideas of uh, the future of capitalism and greed is dead with the context of the bottom billion. So it's about the poorest countries and how the ideas of uh, sort of forward-looking coming together around a common purpose um, where new leaders forging new alliances and new networks can actually make a, a lot of difference in the poorest societies. And sometimes they're doing just that. It's very exciting to see some of the poorest societies really um, use new leaders coming to power in, new socii in, in societies which have been failing, 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 and trying to build new alliances, new networks uh, and taking it forward. So just to, to close with one example, maybe we're not closing, but to give you one example of a, of a real place where this struggle is happening right now, um, Zambia. Um, uh, there's a, a, a very good new leader um, 
uh, who um, performed that African miracle of defeating an incumbent president. Uh, incumbent presidents in Africa have an awful lot of ways of staying in power, um, like counting the votes um, uh, and so on. You know? um, uh, and, and, and so, so this guy managed, managed to, to win, win despite, despite um, an incumbent, incumbent president, president trying all sorts of tricks. tricks. And he and did, did so by getting a tired wave of abuse, of abuse to say, say let's, let's head up, up with these antics, antics. we want to change. change. And so there was an alliance between a massive youth movement, which said we want something that's different, and a leader who's actually pretty, pretty clever, pretty smart, pretty well experienced. And that is a new alliance of a, of a network of youth uh, with a new leader who's got a purpose. And that's very exciting, it's very hopeful, right? It's fascinating uh, to see the connection again from your first, first group of books, books to your new group, group and, then and then all the way back, back to applying, applying again, again at the yeah, Northwest yeah. Regions. Yeah. 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 And, and so, so, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not going to keep writing books, books forever. Somebody else has got to take over doing those, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, and um, you know, know, I've, I've got people I'm working with who are at a more sensible age to do this sort of stuff. But that's the, there's whole vast areas uh, generally, between subjects, the areas between subjects, um, economics, psychology, economic geography, geography, that, that sort of, of and, and, and economic anthropology. Joe Heinrich, who I remember, was a polymath. And, and, and it's, it's no, no accident, accident that he's a polymath. It's because he's, he's got, got a whole range of skills, skills in different, different disciplines. disciplines. They've been able to bring them together and harness that very fertile territory between um, the disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. We've been digging in these bloody silos, economics, <laughs> you know, blah, um, for 150 years, and we're, we're hitting bedrock. There's not that much further to dig within the subjects, but what we've left is great tracks where nobody's dug. Those are the areas uh, where there's huge research opportunities. Um, and academics, young academics, are too scared to go into the territory. I think that's a fascinating point to end on, like fusing together disciplines, finding the places in the earth that haven't been dug up, but not completely that deep because we had bad rug. Uh, Paul, thank you a lot for being here. It was a pleasure having you virtually. And to the audience, thank you for sitting through this wonderful experiment with a screen. Uh, we have a few other interviews coming up. For instance, tomorrow we have the head EU diplomat uh, of the, the Indo-Pacific Indo region, region Gunnar Weigand, and, and in the coming, coming weeks we have a discussion on crypto, crypto which was already mentioned, mentioned with Luna, with two economic <laughs> economists here on stage, one, one very, very much a proponent, one, one very, very much against, against and, and sees the risks, risks. And, and we will have the chief CEO, CEO of Europol, Europol in three weeks, weeks also coming up on our stage. stage. So, so please, please keep an eye on our social media, see the next interviews, and also on our past interviews on Spotify, YouTube, and other podcast platforms. Please, Please give, give one, one more round, round of applause for Paul. Thank you very much.